Well, that's what happened in our Bible reading for today. And actually, Paul was in prison when all of this takes place. And, and we're now in the 26th chapter of the book of Acts, where Paul had, had been arrested. He's on trial. He, he was arrested two years before that. So he was in, in prison for two years. And, and I must say, I've saved this reading for the last of our, our series on Acts because there's this huge breakthrough. Now, we've been looking at Acts each week during the summer. And in order to kind of review and to, to kind of get us to where we're at in our scripture lesson, I've been, I've been throwing out all of these words or phrases that we're finding in our, our Bible readings for the day that, that show the struggles and, and where the disciples were at in their lives, especially Peter and Paul and, and some of the leads. So some of the words that we've talked about, are they, the authorities tried to trick them, and they tried to lie to them and lie about them. There was great division amongst the disciples because some of them were saying, I don't think this is going to work. Let's, let's back off. And then Peter and Paul took that and went all the more, and so there was this huge division. And, and then the word on the streets and what they were trying to accomplish in, in sharing the good news of Jesus and building the church, the, the word on the streets was they're doing this because they're drunk. And other words that, that appeared are arguing. There was arguing all the time. There was opposition. The word reviled is used a number of times, protest, violence. In a number of instances, it says that the disciples, whether it was Peter or Paul or one of the other disciples, they, they either shook the dust off of their feet in testimony against what was happening to them, or they shook the dust off of their clothes in testimony against people. And then... Leading up to today, so we're in chapter 26 and chapter 23, there's a, a verse that says, fearing the crowd and fearing that they would tear Paul to pieces, the jailer took him back to jail. So as you listen and look at those words, it, it sounds quite a bit about the life of Jesus and what was happening in the life of Jesus. So today in chapter 26, we find Paul standing in front of the Roman authorities, the judges. And now this is a different group than the religious authorities. This was the, the government authorities. And, and, and they, had the, they had the right to convict Paul. They had the authority to convict him. And so the two authorities who were there were Festus and Agrippa. And Festus was the governor of the region of Judea and Samaria where, where Jesus spent much of his time. So, so Festus was well aware of this whole situation that had been going on for the last five or six years, even with the time when Jesus started. So the religious authorities, they came to Festus, who was the governor, and they said, we'd like to ask you a favor. Can you release to us secretly Paul? And, and you see, they were figuring out a plot. And, and the plot was, and they even gave it to the king because the king had to go by the law, but if something would happen behind the scenes, the king would have nothing to do with that. So the plot was, while they were transporting Paul from prison to prison, the religious authorities, they would ambush the guards, they wouldn't hurt them, and they would capture Paul and kill him. Well, Festus never agreed on that. But, but you know that's in the background. And then there was Agrippa, who was the king and the grandson of Herod the Great. He was the boss of Festus. And, 
And Agrippa had already killed James, the brother of John, and he arrested Peter. So Peter was in prison somewhere as well. So Paul had already spent much of his time before Festus. Today we find Paul in front of Agrippa. So it was going from governor to king and from king to governor and governor to king, similar again to what they were doing with Jesus. So Paul now comes to this breakthrough that I was talking about earlier. And it was not only this breakthrough for the life of Paul and for the apostles and, and for the church, for that matter, but here's what happened. When, when Paul stood before Agrippa, something changed in him from when he killed James and arrested Peter. So Paul came before him, and the first statement out of his mouth was, you have permission to speak for yourself. One of the other translations than, than ours this morning says, tell us about yourself. And I'm sure Paul is thinking, finally, someone's willing to listen. And I can't help but think that, that Paul's thinking this is this huge relief. And, and that's why I started off this morning with, with the statement, has there ever been a time in your life when you've worked so hard and finally someone listens and finally someone says, tell me more. Tell me about yourself. I remember some years ago, <clears throat> one of my kids, my son, my oldest son, got in a little trouble at school. He actually stood up for someone who he didn't even know, but he thought he was being treated unjustly. And so I remember for a couple of days, I, I, I heard from the teacher. The teacher called and, and explained what went on, and, and she was pretty angry. And then I had conversations with uh, one of the principals, and I had conversations with the administrators, and, and they're just going on about, about my son helping someone who was being treated unjustly, but they looked at it differently. Finally, the assistant principal said to me, tell me what you think happened. In other words, you tell me about your story. Well, Paul takes huge advantage of that statement. Tell me about yourself. Tell me your story. And, and Paul, I only read a portion of it, um, verses 1 through 18, but actually Paul, his statement or his story, it goes on uh, at least double of what I read to you. But Paul went back to his youth, <clears throat> and he said, anybody who knows me <clears throat> knows I was a Pharisee. I was a religious leader even in my youth. And then he said, I used to be like the ones and the people who are standing outside who are against me. I used to be like that. And then he said, I had no idea when I was in that place in my life that those who were outside the Jewish circle were actually God's people. I was bullying them he said. I had them arrested. And then throughout his whole statement, he, he keeps saying things like, but I was following the one who was raised from the dead. He, he keeps inserting that. And then Paul says, my life was changed. And, and you heard the story of his conversion on the road to Emmaus. And he said there was this bright light that blinded him. And then he said, I, I had this conversation, and I asked, who are you, Lord? And 
God said, I'm Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? And this is part of Paul's story. And then the voice said to him, I'm sending you to go to the outsiders. And then, again, Paul threw in the story, I, I can't see why it's criminal to believe that God raised people from the dead. He just kept throwing that in as part of his story. But just in a few minutes, Paul was able to tell the story of getting to the point in his life where he had to decide which road he was going to travel. The one that he had been on, and he would continue to travel on that road, or the road of Christ. He had to choose. He had to make a decision on which road he was going to follow. And I know Paul used the time <clears throat> to share the good news to Agrippa, the king, the evil king. I know he used the time because <clears throat> the king, at the end of what Paul was talking about, the king said to him, you're persuading me to be a Christian. That's huge in the story. And then by the end, the king actually gave Paul permission to be transported to Rome, where Paul wanted to go anyways. That's, that's where he was heading on his missionary journey. It's, his final destination was Rome, and, and the king knew that. And the, and the king said, well, I'll transport you now to Rome. And actually on the way there, while they were in a ship, there was a storm, and the ship wrecked, and Paul was released and freed because he was able to share the word now in Rome, all because he told his story. Now, <clears throat> my other son, some years later, said to me something interesting. One of his grandparents had died. And, and he didn't know a lot of the details of his grandfather's life. So my son said to me, Dad, I don't want that to happen to you. So I actually took about three months of my life and wrote a portion of my story. And I actually published it. I self-published it at this publishing company. And I chose this company because I thought it had the coolest name. It's called Bookiemon.com. And so I worked with this for a number of months, and I actually titled it. This was in 2012. Some of you have seen this. I titled it, Sometimes I Am So Funny. Sometimes. Because there was actually this, this period in my life and my ministry where people just weren't getting how funny I was. And even though I was really funny, sometimes. But I looked it up this week. I hadn't got on the Bookiemon site for ages. And I looked it up. And I saw there were over 3,000 reads to my story. And my first thought was... <clears throat> I don't want that many strangers reading about my life. But then I got thinking. One of the sections I wrote in there <clears throat> was about my favorite Bible verse, which is found in the uh, second chapter of Luke, that nothing's impossible with the Lord. So I got to thinking, if one person could see that and read that and maybe go to the Scripture and find out more about what it means that nothing is impossible to the Lord. Maybe it's worth writing it for 3,000 people. But then I, I looked further at, at some of the other categories. I wrote on what it's like to be born on Christmas. That's a big thing in my 
for me and for my family. So everyone keeps asking that question. So I wrote a section on that. I wrote a section on athletics, being a pastor, being a father, being a husband. I wrote about my children and my sister and Amy, my wife. I wrote about two turning points in my life. But my hope is that by someone reading my story, it may help their story. A friend of mine, Phil, <clears throat> was telling me, he was, a, he was a college roommate of mine, and he said he did the same thing for his mother, who had always wanted to share her story, but never bothered writing it down and uh, just was a little hesitant in sharing the story. So Phil and his brother and sister, they, they took time off work, and they wrote this book that's titled Minor Memories. And it's the story of their mother and their entire family. Plus, when the book was written, and it's a pretty good-sized book, when it was written, they actually took the time to read it back to her so she could hear her story. I'm here today to say to you, <clears throat> you have unbelievable stories to share. And you have to remember <clears throat> that you and I and everyone were created in the image of God. And so when you tell your story and you share your story, you're actually sharing a portion of God's story as well. Now, some of the things that I wrote, I assume my family knew about that, but I, I can't tell you how many times Soon afterwards, <clears throat> people in my family said, I didn't know that about you. <clears throat> well, you have an unbelievable story. If, if you were to write an autobiography <clears throat> of your life right now, what would your title be? Now, as, as Christians, especially Lutheran Christians. Maybe it's, maybe it's the German part. But we have this built-in mechanism <clears throat> that tells us not to tell our story. We'll, we'll be bragging. But remember, when you tell part of your story, you're telling God's story because you were created in the image of God. Imagine if the story of Jesus was not written, or it wasn't told. I, I just talked to someone a couple of weeks ago who's part of a new church, and, and there's about 20 people who are starting this church, and their first community event that they did, even before they worshiped together, their first community event was to sit down as these 20 people and each person took the time to go around and tell a little bit of their story. Eventually, their plan is to write a whole book about the story of people in their, uh, people in their church. You have an unbelievable story to tell. And we, we, you've been getting a glimpse of that in the faith stories that People have been sharing here at Zion. Sherry shared hers last week, and others here have, have shared their stories. We've been doing it for about nine months now. And, and first of all, this is probably a little advertisement for that. If you're interested in that, please see me about sharing your story before I, I call you and ask you to do it. But the stories are unbelievable. I'm looking at in the fall of maybe starting a group that's titled something like Tell Your Story. And uh, maybe it's a, a self-published book or something. There's actually a, a website that's titled Say It Forward. So if you're not sure where to begin, here's, 
here's some questions to consider. And this actually comes from Say It Forward. When did you first accept that you're an amazing person? That you were created in the image of God? When, when did that connect with you? Or what would be a, a bullet point in your life that you're like, aha, something changed? Maybe like Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Or another thing to consider is who have been your mentors in your life? Who have been your friends? Who have been your, your uh, supporters? or say it forward, says begin your story. If you're not sure where to begin, begin your story with, I am amazing because, and fill in the blank. But it finally says, start by just telling one person. Maybe someone who you're with today or someone you're going to see today or just someone that, that supports you in your life. Just Tell them a little bit of your story that maybe you haven't told. So I want to end today by giving you my little blurb that I give to all of our confirmation classes. I've done it for 30-some years. I begin the class, and I say to them, sometime, somewhere, someplace in your life, someone is going to ask you, or make the statement, tell me about yourself. Or tell me your story. You and I all both have amazing stories. May we share that for the glory of God. Let's watch this video this morning. <clears throat>
In the night in which our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it to them to drink, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I invite you at this time to take your communion kits and open the top and take the bread. This is the body of Christ given for you. And the same with the wine. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith and everlasting life and let us pray <coughs> most gracious and heavenly father we come before you today and we give you thanks for your peace your peace which passes all human understanding your peace that the world cannot offer and when the world is in chaos and turmoil and troubled, it is your peace that comes to us fresh and anew each day. Thank you that your son Jesus gave his life, that he died on a cross, that he rose from the dead so that we may have that peace. We also ask that you would give us strength in our lives with that peace to, to share our stories we have amazing stories. Remind us that we are created in your image. And part of our story is your story. And as we share our stories, we are, we are sharing about you and your love and grace. For those who are sick, we lift them up before you today. We ask that as Jesus commanded healing in the cities that he would command healing to those who are sick or struggling. We lift up the family of, of Richard Wardell and ask that you would, you would fill them with that wonderful peace in Jesus Christ. All of these things we ask in the name of him who has taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Would you please stand and sing our closing song?
This concludes our worship service for today. Thank you for being with us in person or in line or in our parking lot. As we go forth in the peace of Christ, may you go forth and share your story and let the peace of Christ be known. Go in peace, serve the world. Thanks be to God. Thank you.